So I think we'll get started. We had a, a quieter start to our meeting than usual. No, no music this month, but we'll, we'll line up some music for the next one. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Jess Hyman on the Ward 3 NPA Steering Committee. And we're so glad that you're spending this glorious evening with us tonight. Um, and I'm sure that everyone else is gonna be watching later when they're not sitting outside in the sunshine. Uh, so here tonight with uh, many of our wards two and three steering committee members. So if you could just give a wave uh, with, so Barbara and Molly and Tony and Charlie. We have a, a few people out today. Patrick will be joining us later and Kevin, um, Kevin uh, isn't available tonight, but we'll see him next time. Um, so let's see. So our next, the next meeting will be June. Uh oh, I don't have the calendar ready here. It is. Is it the second, the second Thursday? Yep. June 10th will be our next meeting. So mark, mark your calendars. Uh, we're already starting to line up, line up items for that agenda. It's sure to be a, a good meeting. Um, and just a reminder that all of our meetings recordings can be found on YouTube um, and on the CCTV's website. So those links are in the, in the agenda. So if you miss part of the meeting tonight, you can watch the recording. Um, we have a, uh, a one uh, NPA announcement, which is that we um, made the decisions about the community grant funding. So if you'll remember from last month, we had some fantastic applications for all sorts of projects that'll benefit the community and bring folks together. And so we had a vote at the last meeting where all, all, at all planning assembly participants were able to vote on their choices for the projects. And then we uh, took all that data together uh, and looked at the funding available. And then the steering committee, committee made some decisions. And so we ended up funding part, fully funding or partially funding all the applicants, which was really exciting. Um, and so the, 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 award, the, the grants will go to the Old, Old North End Neighborhood Band, the Repair Cafe, Vermont Multicultural Festival, the Walk Your Own Path Mural, uh, the, the uh, Wireless Sensor Network Community Workshop, and then some funding for NPA Operations and Outreach and Community Dinner. And we anticipate that with the next round of funding that'll start with the next fiscal year in July, that we'll be doing allocations earlier in the year next year. Um, and so if you want to learn more about, about these fantastic projects, um, if you look on the agenda, there's a link to a spreadsheet with descriptions. And the folks who were funded are already working on their projects. They have until the beginning of June uh, to make their expenses and, um, and submit, their, submit their receipts. Uh, and we'll be checking in with them to make sure they're all on track. And if any of the projects aren't coming along or fall through, then we'll, we'll reallocate those funds. And are there any more steering committee announcements? No? Okay. Well, then we'll open it up to public forum. And if you'd like to, if you'd like to speak at public forum, please um, un un unmute yourself uh, or raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, Tony. If there's nobody else uh, uh, eager to jump in, uh, I just want to uh, just say a couple of words about the, uh, the housing situation. As you know, our, uh, our NPA uh, uh, some weeks, uh, two, three months ago, endorsed uh, uh, a request uh, of the developers of City Place to include uh, about 80 units of uh, um, Section 8 or what, what's really affordable housing uh, assistance, which is 30% of income max uh, rent for any, any, um, uh, app, any recipient. We have about uh, 1,500, 1,500 uh, families and, and individuals in the city of Burlington who receive Section 8 type assistance, either in public housing buildings or, uh, or in rental, uh, rentals of private apartments. Um, there's a, uh, we right now have 1,000 uh, uh, additional individuals and families on the Burlington Housing Authority wait list. And I kept waiting uh, as uh, the city gets about 12 or $14 million uh, and the state gets a, is, the legislature has just allocated roughly a half a billion dollars. I keep expecting to see the state or the city to have its first unit of 30% income rent help. And that just has not happened. We are hopeful that the federal people will add another one or 2,000 
units. We need about 16,000 statewide. One in five renters in Burlington enjoy uh, this 30% uh, income rent. They have, they're happy, they they're have no uh, payment worries for their rent, and they have shelter security. But we have an equal number, another one out of five uh, renters uh, who, who are desperate today. And the city has, uh, has basically, and the, and the uh, mayor and in 10 years and the state uh, are all equally uh, un unwilling or unable to understand that there's people who need rent assistance today and the security that a Section 8 can provide. And we should be budgeting at least a few units, a handful of units even, but in the Burlington budget coming up, and the state should get its stick together and start, uh, start a program. Uh, we have, a, in addition to the ordinary renters, we've got a lot of old folks uh, who own mobile homes, who are, uh, have high rents. Uh, there's some areas that the federal people do not cover, and a program here in the state could begin to fill some of the gaps. Uh, you've got the, the folks who can't get out of prison because there's no apartments that they can afford. You've got folks in mental health institutions. You've got people in the hospital who can't leave because there's not an affordable place or a rent for them available. We have to start, we have to recognize that housing is the biggest problem. Yes, thank you, thank you, Tony. Yes, housing is a huge issue, and we are we have a housing crisis here in Vermont. There are some vouchers that have been released by HUD statewide, uh, including some to um, to Vermont State Housing Authority as well as certain municipalities, though not specifically to Burlington. And I'll just add to that comment uh, to make sure that folks know that the Vermont Emergency Rental Assistance Program is open through BSHA, and this will provide um, a back rent and current rent support utilities, back utilities and current utilities support um, and, and more. And the website for that is ERAP, E-R-A-P dot V-S-H-A dot O-R-G. And there are some requirements, um, but it's a very essential COVID related uh, rental support. So thank you. Um, so next up we have Alona from the city of South Burlington. Hi, good evening. Um... I appreciate being able to speak uh, at your meeting tonight. Um, my name is Alana Blanchard and I work for the city of South Burlington. I'm here tonight uh, because um, the city is preparing an application for a grant to build a pedestrian bicycle bridge over I-89 um, at exit 14. So uh, this is a will be a South Burlington led project. Um, all the funding that we're applying for will be administered by South Burlington and it will be matched by South Burlington. Really, um, I'm here tonight um, because uh, because the bridge is within uh, the bike shed for um, for your MPA, and so I wanted to see if uh, the MPA would be willing to write a letter of support for our grant application. Uh, it's to um, to the federal government, but it's to Secretary um, Buttigieg, and uh, the grant application is for a 14 million dollar. And we're, um, our intention is to build an attractive bridge that actually makes people want to walk across the interstate or bike across the interstate, um, which right now, even though there are facilities, uh, they can be very intimidating. So um, we're putting the application together to submit in um, at the beginning of July, but we would like to gather letters uh, towards the end of June in order to incorporate any great comments that communities might have into our application area. Um, so, and I can send additional information via email, uh, and I'm also happy to answer any questions. Um, one thing that has changed um, under the Biden administration, uh, different from prior years, is that they are interested in any um, equity impacts. So if, uh, if the MPA has any comments related to equity, um, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, so, so how we how we could do this is that you know with the assembled NPA members now we could do a, a quick vote to see whether folks are in favor of writing a letter of support, and then we, the steering committee could draft this letter and present it um, in in advance of the June meeting, and and the membership could could approve it uh, or or not then, and then we can pass it along to the city. Do, how, how do folks feel about that, Tony? I, I so move that uh, we, we do exactly what you described and uh, um, that we could uh, we could take a, a vote tonight and, uh, unless there's some objection. And so I so move. Do we have a second? I'll second. second. 
seconded by Charlie and Barbara at the same time. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The ayes have it. Wonderful. Well, we'll, we'll draft a letter and we'll probably be looking for some more information from you um, to, to frame that. Uh, but it sounds like a fantastic project and it'll definitely benefit folks in our ward, um, many of whom uh, rely on, on foot and bicycle transportation. Well. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Do we have any other public comments? Let's see. Um, seeing none, I'll make a quick announcement. On May 21st, CVOEO is holding its annual Garden Day, and this is free seeds and starts um, for gardeners who, uh, who, who are in need of free seeds and starts. It'll be held up in the Burlington High School parking lot um, in a physically distanced way. It'll be set up as a drive through. Um, the hours, I'm not sure of the exact hours, it'll be about between 11 and 2. Um, so that's at Burlington High School parking lot on May 21st, uh, CBOEO Garden Day. So I encourage you to, spread, to attend and spread the word. Um, do we have any other pu public forum? Well, okay, well, we'll move on to the first item on our agenda. Um, we have Bob Goulding from Public Works and also, um, and Lee, Lee Perry as well. So I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jess, and thank you to the members of the steering committee uh, for Ward 2 and 3 and everyone else for having us here. Um, as Jess said, I am joined by my colleague Lee Perry, the Division Director for Maintenance at Public Works, who will be taking over for me about halfway through this presentation. We did uh, uh, very gratefully make a request or receive the, the okay to um, present to you about our construction season plans for the year, kind of pinpoint where we are in implementation of the Sustainable Infrastructure Plan. Uh, which was funded by some big bond votes about five years ago. And we were going to update you a little bit on the consolidated collection study that the city has been uh, looking at for about a year now. So I'm going to share my screen and talk to you a little bit about construction. And hopefully, if we can get through this quick enough, we'd love to leave time for questions. Can you see uh, the title slide of the presentation? Perfect. So we have already begun our uh, construction season here in Burlington. We've started with some sidewalk work around the city. And we're, we're well underway with getting bids and planning the rest of the team. As I think most folks know, uh, DPW manages quite a bit around the city. Resources are always limited, uh, but we have you know, been implementing a couple different plans, which I'll talk more about, which have given more resources to the department to take on more work. That first plan is the 2016 Sustainable Infrastructure Plan, which was passed overwhelmingly by voters in 2016 with really three focuses for our department, which was sidewalk work, paving work, and really one of the first proactive efforts at water main repairs in the city, rather than the kind of reactive waiting for things to break. In that time, in about the five years of implementation, we've almost been able to triple sidewalk reconstruction, nearly double paving with about 20% of the city covered, and we've made some significant progress on water mains. Now, that being said, we know uh, there is never enough work uh, that's been done. There's always more that can be done. There's a chart on the right of this screen. I'm not going to go too far into details on that. Just present some of the numbers we've done year by year with an update uh, on the kind of cumulative, and we'll be happy to share that down the line if, uh, if you'd like to post this. I did want to uh, give you an update on kind of this big picture on where we are with funding right now. As I've said, we've had more funding than we traditionally have had over the last five years. However, we are at the end of that 2016 bond funding actually uh, ran out a little bit last year. We still have some funds we are relying on for this year, in addition to the normal amount of work that the, the city can take on. To sustain that work of the last four or five years, more funding will be necessary if, as a city, we make that decision that that level of effort is what's needed to keep our The mayor and the council are having that discussion right now including and especially on the use of the American Rescue Plan funds. So if you have any dialogue you want to open up or have already had with your city councilors, you know, that, that's an opportune time to either advocate for more or uh, say go back to normal. Uh, we do have plans in place to pivot to a more robust list if that funding does become available. I'll touch on some of what that means uh, in this presentation. This is a conversation that's going to evolve. However, 
additional funding does or doesn't take place, certainly going to be a part of the budget conversation with the city and or with the mayor and the council over the next few weeks, and potentially further conversations down the line. And with that said, we still look at other ways to maximize city dollars and get work done for the city, such as the Shelburne Street Roundabout, which I think some of you folks may be familiar with, and I'll touch on a little bit later. But that's a very heavily funded, uh, very heavily federally and state funded project to make a significant difference at a, a rather unsafe location in the city. And that's something we're able to do kind of in addition to all the other work that I, I will talk about with these plans that we have. Um, you know, first thing paving, I said we've pretty much doubled the historic average. Our contract is out to bid right now. We'll be taking uh, mostly a, a whole plate, a palette of mill and fill streets, which is milling off the top course of pavement, kind of putting a new course of pavement back down. Not much, if any, reconstruction, which is full depth, very invasive, but also kind of some of the more significant work. We've done quite a bit of that over the last four years on Pine, on Maple, some of the most deteriorated streets. You can see the list we have available here. Two streets, I think, uh, you know, pretty much inwards, uh, two and three, and then a couple alternates, one of which, um, maybe two of which actually are directly in your ward. If and when funding does become available, those streets in yellow, would likely then make the list. Now, this is all dependent on getting, uh, you know, normal bids back in place. COVID clearly has disrupted some of the construction industry. But we're expecting normal bids to a degree, and uh, if they all come back in line and additional funding is available, we will be moving those yellow streets into our 2020. Here, I want to share a little bit about our sidewalk reconstruction plan. Um, we've done a, about 13 miles over the last four years. Normal four-year stretch is four miles. Um, sidewalks tend to have a 40-year life cycle. So these recent trends are really a, a, the necessary trend to maintain that sustainable cycle of being able to replace sidewalks every 40 years, give or take. So this current funding allows short-run repairs, typically you know, 20 feet to 100 or so feet of sidewalk, including parts of what you see in front of you right there. I noted in red that Ward Street is one of the bigger segments of sidewalk will be taken on this year, and uh, that'll be happening in a couple of weeks. Um, now, these are all, again, short segments. I, I have a list, or I have the map to the right. If you're really interested in exactly what kind of uh, segment of street, if you live on that street or really curious, you're more than welcome to reach out to me, and I can uh, let you know the exact parameters. But I at least wanted to let you know what streets we'd be working on this year. Again, in yellow, you can see if additional funding does become available, the couple more streets in your wards, we will be adding parts of Russell, parts of Charles, and a part of Willard. Again, just to underscore, these are all parts of these streets. Uh, the funding isn't in place to do long, long segments this year as it has been in years past. Um, I mentioned that we are putting an emphasis on water mains. Uh, traditionally, we have waited for reactive needs to fix a, a broken pipe. We've uh, done nearly eight miles of our 100 mile network where we've either replaced the full main or relined the full main, which kind of adds structural integrity and decades of life to that pipe. Um, we have more work planned this year, which will represent the end of that 2016 funding on the waterway. We had a pause last year due to COVID. A lot of times this work requires the need to work with a homeowner, enter their houses. 2020 was not the right time for that. We have some challenged uh, segments that we'll be working on, mostly in the south end where the soil conditions are among the worst in the city and tends to lead to the, the most disruptive kind of uh, effect on our underground infrastructure. I do wanna touch a uh, base on a different plan we're working through. I think most folks at least are remember, if not very familiar with the 2018 Clean Water Resiliency Plan, which the mayor directed us and we put forward in, in light of some challenging times that summer with disruptions at our wastewater treatment plant. There were seven key areas we are focused on with that plan to, to upgrade a significant amount of time, uh, money, time, and modernization to our stormwater and wastewater systems. I'm gonna quickly go to the next screen just in the interest of time. Those are seven areas. Here are some updates as to the progress we are making or have made in those key areas. Some of the most challenging issues we had with the age of our wastewater treatment plants has been corrected. Um, these typically are, are what led to those five major issues we had in 2018 at the wastewater treatment plants. That includes uh, full-on replacement of the disinfection systems at the three wastewater treatment plants, 
and a replacement and upgrade of the computer controls and the communications at main plant. Um, these, these should and could uh, prevent the kinds of things that happened in 2018. But we can never say it will fully prevent any issue from going forward, but the system now at the wastewater treatment plants is much more modernized and in a much better place. And we've had some significant rains since the end of this work or where it has given us some confidence in how well the system is performing. On Flynn Avenue, we do have a pump station replacement project underway. There'll be some traffic control that's visible, may lead to some very minor delays. We still want you to go to Oak Ledge Park if, if that's a beach or a park that you like going to. Just be aware there could be a you know three, five, 10 minute delay depending on the day, depending on the work we're doing. We currently have out to bid miles of sewer and storm pipe repair. These are critical to prevent any sanitary overflows. You know, in the city, these are critical for the health of the 100 plus mile system that we have. We have green infrastructure planned in the south end, which will consist of above ground rain gardens because of the soil type they have. I can go into more detail if there are questions or in the future. And certainly our water resources team would love to come talk about that. But I do just wanna point that out. That's our most challenging area for combined sewer overflow is in the above the Pine Street CSO area, as they say, we are uh, making with, with grant funding from the state a significant amount of headway with trying to capture impervious runoff in one concentrated part of the city. We're actually exploring projects in the old North End right now, which will likely be subsurface systems. So the construction could be disruptive. That would be a year or so in the future, but it wouldn't be as disruptive from any loss of parking or any other <clears throat> kind of challenges the way a rain garden could present. So be mindful of that. And certainly our water, water resources team uh, will be in touch with more on those projects. Just want to touch base quickly on two projects uh, in the heart of wards uh, two and three. Um, uh, North Champlain, uh, there was a, a public meeting a few weeks ago in March. Our plans right now are to construct a two way protected bike lane in place of the bike lane and one of the travel lanes that exists on North Champlain. This will be done uh, with a significant amount of grant funding as well, going back to how we try to stretch city dollars. It will include an additional series of improvements on Manhattan Drive, including new traffic signals and pedestrian signals at North Champlain and Manhattan Drive. A uh, smaller footprint intersection and visibility improvements at Park in Manhattan, which has been a challenged intersection, I know for students and parents crossing, as well as narrow, tr uh, narrower travel lanes for slower traffic. All that said, design is currently underway. I can't present you with any final plans or, or, or you know, 100% plan details at this time. We did have a public meeting. There's a video available, which we can circulate that link. It's on the screen on our Facebook page. Uh, you don't need to be a Facebook member to watch that. We just hosted it live via Facebook and Zoom. We have a second one scheduled um, or a, to be scheduled for summer. We have a project website, which will be undergoing a refresh in the next few days. So. Keep all this in mind if you have interest in that project. The other project, and these plan sets are always harder to see. We made sure to use uh, more interesting colors uh, to kind of make it pop more, but we do have a raised intersection planned for the North Ave Washington Berry intersection. Um, reason for the project, as you can see here, we've received numerous complaints about the safety of this crossing. This was studied as part of the 2015 North Ave corridor study. Um, Plans, funding have finally come into place and come into view where we are now, um, I think we're, we're done with being out to bid. I believe we've got our contractor and we are meeting to discuss traffic control next week. But essentially this project's gonna consist of a five inch speed table at that intersection, a whole host of other improvements like stormwater capture, pavement marking, signage, sidewalk ramps. Um, the crosswalk across North Ave, the existing one will be relocated. And I know folks have advocated for RRFBs, which are those flashing, blinking crossing lights that predominantly you'll see on North Ave and Pine Street and, and on um, uh, Willard Street now, Colchester Ave. Uh, we aren't putting those in just yet, but we are gonna continue to collect data and monitor counts and observations of how traffic and pedestrians respond in that area. And this doesn't close the door on the future ability to do that. Uh, the timing is uh, late May, lasting about six weeks. Sometimes those projects go a little longer if weather's not cooperative. Expect travel delays. And uh, um, I have a screen, a slide at the end that shows you how to sign up for some updates if you want to stay really up to date. I'm not going to go into detail on the Shelburne Street Roundabout project. Just like to bring this up if folks commute through the area. 
It's a big project funded um, by the feds, by the state. We're partnering with the state, who's the primary manager here. We are constructing a single lane roundabout. This is likely to start sometime over summer, likely to last about two years. This will be another disruptive project with the second traffic flow. But I think, I think we truly believe, and many folks we've heard from really believe this is uh, uh, hopefully a game changer with respect to being an existing high crash location. We're excited about finally kicking this project off. I'm gonna end my presentation there. You can see a couple different URLs or ways to contact us or sign up for alerts. This is a really great slide. It's available on our website. Um, I encourage you to sign up for as much as you can. And I'll turn this over to Lee Perry who will use the remaining time we have, if you have any, and uh, go through consolidated collection. Hello everyone, as, as Rob pointed out, my name is Lee Perry. I'm the Div Division Director of Maintenance for Public Works and uh, I'd like to talk consolidated collection. Um, as uh, the heading says, it's using one hauler to provide trash recycling compost pickup, you know, to addresses with one to four residential units. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2018, City Council passed a resolution uh, directing DPW to study uh, consolidated collection for trash recycling compost. Out of a nationwide study, it showed that 83% of municipalities consolidate their services. So here in Burlington, we're really uh, in the minority um, in our situation. Uh, the consultant's report found, you know, the following benefits and environmental economic benefits, uh, quality of life with the reduction of truck traffic in, in uh, dense neighborhoods, uh, reduced vehicle miles traveled, um, next slide, please. And, you know, the possible scenarios going forward as a city, we need to decide if, if we should consolidate services or not. And if yes, which options and the options being, uh, consolidated services, uh, in a franchise model where we would put out to bid to private haulers for contracts to service zones throughout the city districts, um, or uh, you know, a municipal model where the city would provide consolidated collection services and, you know, Hello? whoa. Hey, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. I'm listening. Okay. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So okay. yeah, they've been removed. Just, sorry for the interruption. No worries. Uh, municipally operated consolidated services where uh, the municipality would pr provide all the collection services for trash recycling and compost. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a cost comparison of the two models being franchised and municipal. Um, just to give us some context right now, residents in the city pay anywhere from 28 to $49 a month to have just their trash and recycling picked up through the various haulers. Um, with a municipal model, uh, we, we originally identified two options, but expanded it to three as a 0% opt-out, a 15% opt-out, and a 25% opt-out. So opting out would mean residents would have the choice to opt out of the program and self-haul. Um, to a drop-off center, uh, you know, either locally or in a nearby community. So in the 0% opt-out, you can see our prices are pretty competitive with the franchise model. And as you lessen the participants, obviously the price is gonna go up um, where we are a little bit higher on the 25% opt-out end um, and a little bit on the 15% opt-out end. Um, that being because you know, starting a municipal operation, we're going to have a heavy capital investment um, in the trucks, buildings, um, salaries. It's going to be an endeavor. Um, next slide, please. So next steps, we're evaluating all scenarios. Uh, we're going to present our recommendations coming up at the, the following date. So the next one will be at the Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee on the 25th. Then uh, Public Works Commission on the 16th of June. Um, and, you know, if the council decides to advance consolidated collection, it's going to take some time to implement this program. You know, we want to do it, you know, methodically well thought out um, because it's going to be right. Uh, and that could take anywhere from two to three, maybe even four years. 
Next slide, please. And as, as Rob indicated, your feedback is welcome. Um, here are some links that you can go to to get the consultant study for the original franchise model. Um, there are other documents available at um, links to the Transportation Energy Utilities Committee as well as Public Works Commission with memo submitted and, and information there as well. And if you would like to talk about this, you can give me a call or email me. I don't know if my email is listed there, Rob, but um, we can provide that for you as well. Thank, th thank you so much, Lee and Rob. Uh, we do have a couple minutes for, we've got four minutes for questions. So I would invite anyone who would like to hear more or, or ask a question or has a comment, feel free to unmute yourself or use the raise hand function. Charlie. Okay, so um, uh, everything sounds good, but I remember that for 20 years, uh, the Department of Public Works, even 20 years ago or more, were saying how worried they were about the water and sewer lines in Burlington and how it was becoming more and more of a crisis. So I've been hearing that for over 20 years. So I'm disappointed to hear how little has been done with it. And I, I was especially hoping this year because of money coming in from the American Rescue Plan or whatever it is from the pandemic, I was hoping there would be a ton of money that we could put into that infrastructure. I mean, it's nice to hear about paving projects. Oh, Charlie, you froze off. Through the streets and the sidewalks and things. Okay. I think Char Charlie froze, but um, I but Rob, would can you respond to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well. You know, in a city with um, with 40,000 people and 95 miles of roads, 130 miles of sidewalks, 100 miles of water mains, 100 and uh, some odd miles of sewer and storm pipe, there will always be a need to reinvest in that infrastructure in a dense urban area. I would say the pro productivity of the last four years, five years, does stand kind of on its own as a really significant uh, milestone. We've paved 20% of the roads. We've um, uh, tripled our sidewalk reinvestment. Um, we, we also, you know, we are strong advocates for our own work. So if there is more resource, more resources available this year, uh, we can put those to work. Now, the budget conversation is happening with the mayor and the city council right now. Um, the mayor has advocated, as has the city council, for more resource investment in infrastructure. All of those American uh, recovery funds need to be um, devoted, you know, a myriad variety of city priorities. So we do hope and expect if, if there is availability, we'll do even more than we've presented this year. But I do think the work of the last four or five years has truly represented a five-year era of just, you know, massive investment. The resources were, were made available, we've made use of them. And if there are more resources this year through that federal funding, which right now it's not allocated to us, we will have plans in place to use those. Thank, thank you, Rob. Do we have other questions? Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, um, I would, I would, I'll just make a quick comment. You know, as someone who lives right on North Champlain Street, I'm really looking forward to the Im improvements on our street and the two-way bike lane, which I, I know will not, not only increase uh, the safety for bicyclists, but will also slow down traffic. So I think between that and the North Avenue um, pedestrian crossing that you're talking about at Manhattan, both of those things will really increase the, the safety in our in our area. And I would also advocate for that flashing pedestrian light on North Ave. I think that would go a long way. Uh, let's see, we have time for one more question or comment. And I see, Tony, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi, <clears throat> Rob, I have, I have two questions. Uh, one, uh, we have 20 high crash intersections in the city. And I really don't hear anything this year being done uh, about any of those. The uh, one, uh, the, the roundabout one is the 21st, that's been taken care of. Uh, I, I just find it strange that we don't prioritize uh, the, the, where, where we're having one and a half entries a year uh, to deal with that. The second question is, uh, we hear about lead in pipes. How many 
pipes do we have in the city uh, and what are the lengths uh, the, of, of lead line pipes, water pipes? None. None. Okay, good. So yeah. there's no there's no lead in uh, in uh, Burlington water. That's good. Okay. Very, very. <laughs> Maybe a few outliers that are like almost impossible to find, but mains are not lead and most of the services that were lead have been replaced. There's probably a few somewhere, but it's not, it's just almost non-existent. That's so Robin, Steve. Steve. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you for a former DPW director, Steve Goodkind, who knows the system as good as anybody. Thank you. Yeah, we, uh, we have, we have, you know, we, you know, uh, I know division director Moyer has taken that seriously, has looked and relooked to make sure we know our system in and out, especially in light of, uh, you know, what happened in Michigan a few years ago. So lead in drinking water, as uh, Mr. Goodkind said, is not a concern here. Um, Megan has been very focused on making sure we know what the health of our system is. Tony, uh, your feedback on the high crash locations is noted. Um, they are important. I mean, we have, you know, there have been a, a number of projects we've focused on. Shelton Roundabout, as you know, you said it's the 21st location. Uh, some of the work on Winooski Ave was meant to kind of focus on some of these high crash, um, uh, you know, unsafe locations. So it's noted, I'm gonna share that directly with our transportation team and our uh, management. Thank you. Great. Well, th thank you very much, Rob and, and Lee. Uh, we really appreciate your presentation and we will, uh, and we appreciate you coming to see us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for um, having So we're me. gonna move on to our next item. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, which is, uh, we, we have Steve Goodkind and Tony Reddington of the Pine Street Coalition, and they'll be talking about the Champlain Right Way Initiative. And we're on, Tony, have you got slides you want to try and coordinate with this? Right, I, Most of what I'm going to say is slides, but to you get might to want them. I'm trying to get them to Zoom so I can see everybody. I can't uh, to, uh, Liam, I want to share the, well, the PDF I have. Mm -hmm. You you should have the capability to as a co-host. I, I, I can't get the, and, and going back and forth here, I cannot get to the, the Zoom screen uh, for some reason. Um, well, let me try that. Okay, I'm there. And um, I'm looking for the share. And now I will go to the slide show. And Steve, you're on. Steve uh, Goodkind will be leading us off. And Tony, as we talked about, there's that one slide that I'm interested in. You may need other slides for your part of it, but I only need that one slide to, to graph the traffic. Okay, start anyway. off. I'll go. I'll go to it after we after there you. There we go. The okay. We've That's got it. fine. Yeah. Anyway, uh, as Tony said, Tony and I are from a group called the Pine Tree Coalition, and we've been advocating for a better Southern connector now for about six years or so. I was formerly for about 30 years, city engineer and public works director. And at one time I was the manager of the Southern Connector project. Uh, so I probably know much as much about its history as anybody. Tonight I wanna to focus on one part of its history. And that is the environmental justice part of this project. It's uh, environmental justice is something most people are hearing about lately. It's been in the news along with Black Lives Matter in the last year or so. But it's been around for longer than that. And I'm going to tell a little bit of a story of how the city has gone from what I would consider an advocate for environmental justice, more or less an apologist for a project that does not cut it as far as environmental justice is concerned. That project is the Southern Connector in, this, in its present configuration. Let me get rid of this phone call. There we go. OK, anyway, Southern Connector project has been around for a long time. It's changed over time. Its concept hasn't changed, but its route has changed. And it goes back to the 60s. It was part of a ring road system. It was gonna connect the interstate, wrap around the various towns of Chittenden County, almost forming a circle around the county. The Northern Connector is part of it. The Essex Bypass is part of it. Route 189 off the interstate is part of that ring road concept. The Circumventure Highway, which I think is pretty much an abandoned concept now, was part of it. And the last remaining part that is still alive in some form is the Southern Connect. The road itself, contrary to popular belief, was not meant to be a new, better way into downtown Burlington. That's not its purpose. Purpose, purpose was to provide 
an alternate north-south route across Burlington, an alternate to Pine Street. And in doing, and this alternate was supposed to take traffic out of neighborhoods like Glen and Home and Maple and Pine and King Street. That's what it's about. It wasn't about bringing more traffic into downtown. Maybe that could be an, a, a, that could happen because of it in some ways possibly, but that's not what its purpose was. And those that say that that's what we're trying to do, that's not what we're trying to do. That's not what the city tried to do for 40 years. The project itself uh, had to go through various environmental uh, reviews over its time. I was involved with the two most recent ones. And one was in the 90s, one was in the early, in the middle 2000s. During both of those uh, reviews, the city had to justify or look at various alternates for this project, select the one that they thought was the best, and then see if that one met all the criteria that environmental impact statements have to meet. In 1996 or seven, when I was managing the project, the state wanted us, or the feds wanted us, the federal government was providing most of the money for the project. They wanted us to look at a route that did go right up Pine Street to Main Street. At the time we said, no, that's just contrary to everything this project has been trying to do for 30 years, not interested. They said, okay, the matter was dropped. And a version of the project was eventually approved in that environmental document, which uh, the city was happy with. And I think the feds in the state at the time were happy with. About 10 years later, we had to do another update of that environmental impact statement. The federal government said, what about this route that could go up Pine Street all the way to Maine? And we said, once again, not interested. They said, well, tell you what, we're interested in it. We want you to look at it. In fact, we want you to make that the preferred alternative for the project. We were pretty taken aback by that. To make a long story short, the city fought for three years trying to show how that route did not meet the criteria that we had established for the project, and it did not meet the criteria of the environmental impact statement that it had to meet. One of those things we challenged it on was environmental justice. We said that particularly in the case of the main of the uh, Maple King Pine Street neighborhood, that neighborhood is low income and minority, in this case, minority uh, black uh, and African American, that's the minority. It's clear that it meets that criteria. We argued it, but the federal government said, well, we understand what you're saying, and maybe the criteria isn't being met, but that criteria is not that important at this point in time. It didn't have the weight of the other criteria in the environmental impact statement. Some of those criteria, like historic preservation, were going to win the day when we had to choose our route. And we and environmental um, justice really wasn't a strong criteria in those days. So eventually, after threats by the federal government to withdraw all the money from the project, and actually they did withhold money for many years, uh, Mayor Kiss finally folded and said, okay, we'll take what we can get. That's what you're gonna give us. We'll try and do that project. The project, I'll say stumbled along, fast forward to the mid uh, teens, 2015 or so, the, this uh, Pine Street Coalition formed, and we thought maybe there's some way, even though it seemed like hopeless, that we could maybe get this project back on track and make it a better project, a modern project, and not be stuck with this old project and a project which really was imposed on us by the federal government. We hired an attorney, a uh, document was filed in federal court, and it listed five or six things that we thought were wrong with the project. One of them was that it failed to meet environmental justice criteria. The thing that was different this time about that criteria was with the Obama administration, criteria had been greatly strengthened. And now it was more of a mandate for the project. It wasn't something which had to be looked at in addition to some other things which could override it. It was a top priority. Projects have to meet that. And to our surprise, when the documents were filed and the Department of Justice looked at them, and they're the ones that represent the federal government in matters like this, the Justice Department said, well, we think we're in pretty good shape on this, except we agree with you that environmental justice criteria has not received an adequate review in this project. And what they did was, to make a long story short, they withdrew the decision that was made back in 2009 or so that established the route of the project up Pine Street to Main Street. They withdrew that. 
I'd never heard of anything even happening like that before, but they did. And it gave us an opening now to go back and have the project looked at from an environmental justice standpoint. And our belief is if you do look at it from that, do a good review, the current project cannot pass muster. And in fact, if somehow the state, the city and the federal government try and push it through, they'll probably face a lawsuit from us and we'll try and challenge that and see if we can't prevail. Oh, wow. And I think the uh, federal government, especially with Pete, with Pete Buttigieg in charge, oh, wow. I think the transportation the Department of Transportation is very much looking at environmental justice and making sure criteria is being met and not allowing it to be swept under the rug. So we'll see what happens with that. But I think the good news is it isn't like there's no project. There are ways to do this project. Even what was approved in the first environmental impact statement back in the 90s is a much better way to do this project that meets environmental justice criteria. Tony will talk a little bit about what could be done here. And I just want to note one last point, though, because it's a slide that up, and then I'm going to turn it over to Tony. This slide shows exactly what is wrong with the environmental justice criteria as far as this project is concerned. Environmental justice says that the federal government is not going to build projects that disproportionately impact minority and low-income neighborhoods. And the disproportionate impact is very clearly represented on this chart. What it shows is in the neighborhoods, of Home and Flynn Avenue, and more to the left of this chart. Traffic will see large reductions, 72% in one case. On the right side of the chart is what happens to the Maple King Pine Street neighborhoods. They see an increase in traffic of 32%. That is what we say is in black and white, or in this case, red and blue and purple. <laughs> that is the definition of environmental justice not being met. They are seeing a disproportionate impact of this. And I'll say my last closing statement. The city fought against this current design when I was the manager of the project. We fought strongly against it. It's actually the city has now gone to being an apologist for the project. But I think the city was on the right track. I think the comments and the stand the city took 10 years ago is still valid. And I think we're going to try and do our best to see if the city can move forward but by moving toward a better alternative. So I'd said a mouthful. Tony will talk a little bit more about what might be done with this project. Thank you, Steve. And Tony, just a heads up, we have a little less than 10 minutes left for this agenda item, and we want to make sure there are time for questions within that time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Jess. Um, so again, to summarize uh, what, we, what we're watching in this project, and I think that the, the picture of the students getting on the bus at the corner of... Uh, uh, this, this photo is a, a taken at the corner of Pine Street and Maple Street, sort of says it all. Uh, this uh, this uh, uh, King Maple neighborhood perhaps has the highest concentration of, of uh, residents with black and, and brown skins in the state. And of course, uh, as we all know, we're in the Old North End. The Old North End, King Maple, and on to, to uh, uh, onto Winooski has uh, 26 to 29 percent uh, uh, poverty level incomes. Uh, and one uh, up to a third, 30%, according to Representative McCormick, 30% uh, of the people who live in King Maple and, and, and the uh, old North End that Kurt represents, they have no access to a car. So they're totally dependent upon walking and transit. Um, <clears throat> we feel that we can make a change and promote uh, uh, car alternatives and more effective traffic routes rather than disrupt our communities with more car traffic. Uh, to put these numbers again, the, uh, that Steve stressed, again, traffic in King Maple up 37%, uh, uh, Flynn Avenue uh, uh, down, uh, below, down 72%. And then if you look at the census tracts of King Maple, 77% uh, of the residents of King Maple uh, are, are uh, low and moderate income. And that area, the relatively well-to-do folks who live below uh, Flynn Avenue, only 34% low and moderate income. So both by income and in terms of uh, racial uh, makeup, this, this project cannot fly. So as a result, and this is news, uh, brand new slide, <clears throat> we say first things first, rear yard, then a redesigned parkway elements, put King Maple first. So we're suggesting actually it was uh, uh, City Council President uh, Max Tracy who first said this, suggested that we, we do uh, the, the uh, so-called rail yard project first, which will bypass King Maple and immediately uh, provide, uh, will, will immediately uh, uh, stop 
uh, any cutting of the King Maple in, in two will actually improve the, uh, reduce the traffic, reduce the congestion, reduce the pollution and make it safer by doing that section first. And how did that happen? Well, your Pine Street Coalition did drop a court case in a year ago, two, uh, two years ago. Uh, we've been through the environmental justice process, which we expect to be completed this summer. But the Federal Highway Administration suddenly saw the light and they changed their position and say, oh, Burlington, you please take $20 million and build the rail yard project, hoping that somehow they could finesse uh, the rest of the parkway through. So uh, your, your Pine Street Coalition is uh, in a meeting has decided, and you're the first to hear it, that we want to see, as Max, uh, Councilor Max Tracy has uh, uh, suggested, the, the rail yard project first that relieves and improves King Maple, and then the revision, uh, uh, revised elements of the parkway as, as we've, been, we've been pushing now for years uh, come second. Um, I wanna give a shout out to the Walk Bike Council who first found completely, uh, found no uh, walk and bike facilities in the entire project that were satisfactory in, in letters to the city and to the public works. By the way, they never got a response to those letters. And this is, this is really what the uh, Walk Bike Council and Pine Street and now joined by the Vermont Racial Justice uh, Alliance really would like to see on the entire route from uh, down at uh, down at Queen City Park Road right up to and and, and going over to uh, 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 over to the uh, Battery Street where it'll meet the Burlington Bike Path and actually sort of make a make a loop and that is on the right you see a, a bike a a, a a sidewalk there is no sidewalk we're spending a hundred million dollars on this Parkway project and there isn't one inch of sidewalk. And beside that, we will have a two-way bikeway. Not a single inch of accommodation of safely of bicycles in this hundred million dollar project, as the city has been pushing it. It is a it's a scandal, and uh, we think this is would make a world class uh, walk and bike facility through the entire two mile route. You can do a circle circuit then over to the bike path, the bike path along the shoreline down to to uh, Oak Ledge Park and back over to this uh, facility or reverse. And you can stop and have uh, lunch, of course, or a bite to eat at the South, uh, at the cafe there at uh, the um, uh, South End, uh, at the co-op South End. So the Champlain right way is a multimodal transportation improvements alternative to the obsolete, environmentally harmful and racially unjust Southern Connector Champlain Parkway proposal. We'll take some questions. I think we're, we've gotten the the uh, message across. And of course, we'll do best practices roundabouts too at the new intersections. And by the way, the city does, uh, uh, Rob, note this, Rob Golding, that the city has, and, and, and Chapin Spencer advocates a roundabout at that uh, junction at Curtis Lumber and, uh, Mount, and, and Pine Street and Kilburn Street that would take you over to, the, to, to Battery Street. So we, we, we are pleased that they, they included a roundabout even in their plan. Thank you very much, Tony and Steve. So, uh, who has questions? And feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, and while folks are gathering their questions, I do have one question for you. So how can folks get involved or if they want more information, how do they? Well, they can uh, first, uh, they can go to uh, safestreetsburlington.com. Uh, and uh, we're trying to keep our, our information updated. We also, Pine Street also has a Facebook page. Uh, where we try to keep things located. Obviously, uh, you can contact, uh, uh, my, my name is on the, on the steering committee and email address is on, online. Uh, and uh, um, Steve, any other suggestions how they can contact us? Well, there's us, but also I think if you feel strongly about what we're saying, let your city councilors know that. They're gonna be making some decisions in the future. We hope we're gonna make a decision that we agree with, but that's who needs to hear you want a better project, you want environmental justice. And it can be done. This project, as Tony has described it, the root of it is the same route that the feds approved us to use in the 1990s in that first environmental impact statement. The route included rail enterprise, what we think of as rail enterprise north was part of the project. And in fact, our alternative that we tried to persuade the feds to accept in the second most, in the most recent environmental impact statement, again, used a route through the rail yard. So this isn't something we've just pie in the sky. 
this is what the city had wanted. This is what we, for 30 years, thought we were going to be doing. And I think people need to let their counselors know you want to see this done and it, have it done right. And we can have Thank a good project if we do it. Thank you, Steve. Um, do we have any, any questions? By the way, the, oh. just add that the, the rail yard project will be coming to city council this summer uh, mm -hmm. in a contract for the city to sign to manage the planning uh, phase, uh, which a lot of what work has already been done, as you know, uh, that uh, anyone who's been around it, I think the, the rail yard planning, base planning was done about uh, four or five years ago. And we also have the work that was done during Steve's era when they were looking at this alternative uh, route. Great. Well, well thank, thanks again for being here and thank you for your, you. your advocacy for the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So now, uh, now our next item up on the agenda, uh, we have Jessica Laffel and Eric Farrell of Farrell Properties to give us an update on the Cambrian Rise development. So welcome, Eric and Jessica. And do you have do you have slides to show? Yes, I have slides. Okay, great. So Tony, Tony, you'll need to stop sharing, um, and then Jessica can bring up her slide. <clears throat> Super. Thank you. Thanks. I think it's done. Well, I, oh, that's a nice view. So, whoops disappeared. Oh, did it? I'm sorry. Well, while, while Jess is doing that, I'll, I'll give you a thumbnail of where we've been and where we are today. Does that make sense? Are you able to see it now? Yes, I can see it. Anybody else there? Yep, we can see it now. Thank you. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Just disappear. Yeah, you you disappear. Okay, so um, Cambrian Rise. We were approved back uh, by the city and the state Act 250 back in 2000. I don't know, 16, 17. And uh, their first building to open was the Liberty House. The former orphanage opened up in 2017. Uh, 65 units, one condo, but 64 apartments. Then uh, fast forward to October of 2019. Actually, Jess, can you show the site plan? And I don't know if the building letters, oh, there's no building letters on there, are there? Oh yeah, you can sort of read that. So Liberty House, which is in the middle uh, facing North Avenue, if you can read the plan. Yep. And then the next building to open was Laurentide. Uh, uh, Champlain Housing Trust opened that building in October of uh, 19, 76 unit subsidized family housing. Then we opened the Rise, which was a new addition attached to the old classroom, Burlington College's classroom building, 94 units. That opened in July. Uh, these are all apartments now, I'm sorry. Uh, opened up in July of uh, 2020. We we're supposed to open up in May, but we got delayed a little bit by the COVID stuff. And then um, Cathedral Square just opened uh, Juniper House, 70, 70 units of subsidized senior housing in February, March of this year. Our next building we're going to start is another apartment building, Sunset House. We're gonna, we were supposed to start that in March of uh, last year, 2020. We're probably not going to start it until the fall of this year. So we're a year and a half behind, all thanks to uh, what's been going on in the world. And then our next adventure would be um, our first uh, foray into the condominium market for sale, 202 units. We hope to start that building in uh, January, end of the year, or, or the first quarter of 2000 and, uh, 2022. Um, so a little bit of background, we were originally approved for 770 units. There's actually no density cap in this district, but there was a density cap in my development agreement with the city. Um, the city council last year increased that cap from 770 to 950. 
because there's so much demand for housing. Um, and remember that 25% of everything, 25% of the rentals and 25% of the for sales units all have to meet the inclusionary requirements. Um, and the breakdown will be roughly um, out of 950 units when we're done, will be uh, 513 apartments, rental units, and including the two buildings that the nonprofits built and 437 condos, condominiums, home ownership units. Um, a lot of people ask us when will, will be, we be done? And uh, that's anybody's guess, depends on market conditions. I think we'll be done uh, probably in five years if all goes well. Now we'll show you a couple of more views. The next slide is a view of the overall project as though it were complete. You can obviously, uh, uh, pick out Liberty House, uh, kind of our iconic building in the at Cambrian, and uh, to the right of that, uh, facing North Avenue, the other way, Jess, the facing North Avenue, and then runs down parallel to the to the uh, cemetery is the condominium building I just mentioned, 202 units. We'll build it in two phases. It'll probably take three years, start to finish. To, to build it in two phases and sell units in two phases. Um, and then go back to Liberty House, Jess, if we, to the left of Liberty House, uh, south side is the, is the rise, 94 uh, apartment units in, uh, in the, brick, uh, the brick classroom building in the addition. And then south of that is, is Cathedral Square that opened just this spring. And then west of Cathedral Square is Laurentide which, uh, which uh, Champlain Housing Trust opened. And then our next uh, apartment building is uh, what we call Sunset House, 125 units. Again, we'll start that later this year. And it'll take 18 months, 14 to 18 months to build. And then, um, so after those are done and the condo building I mentioned, we'll have, there's, there's four other buildings. There's uh, in the Southwest corner is building Southwest corner, the other the other corner, Jess, that is on lot four. That was originally going to be condos. It's going to be apartments. Um, and we are probably going to sell that to another local um, uh, investor developer type who's going to build that building, probably start later this year. And then going uh, north on the site next to that is building what we call building. Well, building, uh, yes, I'm sorry, Jess, so building... H, that'll be for sale, probably all inclusionary, 72 units. West of that will be building P, market rate, might have some inclusionary units in it, all for sale, condominiums. And then the last building on the northwest corner would also be condominiums, uh, probably contain some inclusionary as well. So when we're done, we'll have 950 units, um, 100 and... Um, 28 inclusionary apartments, 109 inclusionary for sale units in a total of 950. And I'd like to be done before I'm 80 years old. So I got to get cracking. Um, next picture would be, so that's a close up of the condo building that we're going to start uh, in the first quarter. Um, uh, facing North Avenue, five stories on North Avenue six stories in the middle. Um, the next slide is, what's the next? So the next slide is if you're um, hovering over um, the end of the site where the bike path is, the, the land we sold to the city, looking back up at Liberty House, we had said at the outset that we wouldn't build anything in the corridor that would interrupt the view from Liberty House to the lake because we wanted to honor the uh, Liberty House building. So. In the foreground, you see a large green, which is a common amenity of Cambrian Rise the, you know, for, um, for the use of all the residents there, um, kind of an un unscheduled space. It won't be structured in any way for the Frisbee or outdoor events or whatever uh, the association uh, decides to allow. Um, and then I think the last slide is a view of Cambrian from uh, with Texaco Beach in the foreground and a completed Cambrian Rise project in the background and 
an awful lot of steam uh, billowing out of the McNeil plant in the far ground in Mansfield way back. So that's a pretty short version of the story. Hasn't changed a whole lot other than the total number of units, a little more housing, a little less commercial space. Um, and uh, probably the, I think our, our timeline is stretched to probably a couple of years because of uh, what's been going on in the world. So, but we're pretty excited about it. And with that, I would answer any and all questions that anybody might have. Thank you very much, Eric. It's great. It's nice to see the updated plans. And yeah, you know, we all know that we need more housing. Um, it's also uh, good to see that the inclusionary units seem to be spread a little bit. They're not just segregated into one area. So I think that that type of mix, mixed use, um, you know, mixed income development is really important. So that's mm -hmm. good to see as well. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so do we, have, do we have questions? I'm sorry. Oh, you're yeah. asking people if they have questions. Yep, yep. Sorry. So we, uh, Molly, Molly has her hand up. Yeah. Hey, this is Jacob oh, talking Jacob. through Molly's speaker. <laughs> hey, uh, one thing I would like to comment on is I, I see some colors in here, which. A muted color. So keep it up. Even go bolder if you want. I would love to see more colors in our building. Um, question I have is, um, I know in one of the buildings that you've built, there is, I think, some maybe worker space on the bottom floor. It sounds like there's not too much of a market for retail or commercial space, but wondering if your buildings have flexibility on the ground level to adapt to that as this community occurs over time. Sure. Uh, Jess, go back to the other uh, aerial showing the street side. Um, yeah, so that one. So in building B, the rise, there's uh, there's about 10,000, uh, well, there's actually 11,000 square feet of commercial space. And the kind of commercial space we're looking for is uh, we have a commitment from a group that's going to do a, a cafe and a, and, a, and a food to go um, uh, shop, which we think is pretty important. Um, we'd like to attract uses that would serve the residents, uh, certainly people off the street or and people who live in the neighborhood across the street, but, uh, but, but primarily the people that live at Cambrian Rise. Um, so we're, we're going to try and be, as, as economics will allow, we're going to try and be as fussy as we can with who we uh, attract for commercial. We've got about 100,000 square feet of commercial um, uh, earmarked in various buildings, Mo more of it along North Avenue, but it could be sprinkled anywhere as uh, time time goes on. It'll be primarily a residential development, but it will have services. Uh, and, and another important aspect that that I should mention is that we're going to widen North Avenue on the west side of our road, add about 35 on-street parking places and a separated bike path and a bus uh, uh, and a pull-off for the bus. We also built, I, we think, the second nicest maybe the first, second nicest um, bus stop in the city of Burlington. It's a climate controlled uh, uh, facility at the, at the southeast corner of the Rise building. Probably won't open until next year, um, but we, it, it, it serves, um, it, it's a huge statement on our part, we think towards uh, uh, encouraging people to use public transportation. That's in addition to us connecting to the bike path um, and uh, we put bike facilities, um, a lot of bike facilities and, and, you know, bike wash, bike storage, bike everything in all of the buildings. So, um, uh, so we think that um, this will be a great place to live and we'll have some commercial. <clears throat> Thank you. Do we have other questions or comments? Danny. Hi, I'm just wondering if there's going to be, I, maybe I missed it in a slide, but is there beach access? And, the, and I'm also wondering about the land behind or in between Cambrian Rise and Texaco Beach. Okay. Um, being like kind of publicly accessible. I'm definitely one of those people that uh, has enjoyed that space. 
for many well, years. Well, the, the public, I, I grew up in Burlington, so the public has enjoyed crossing this property, even though it's privately owned, for like several decades to get from North Avenue to the beach. And so one of the first things that we agreed upon when we, we went through a year long process negotiating with the city, uh, a, a development agreement. And one of the primary tenets of that agreement is that we sold the city uh, all of the land on the south, uh, southerly end of the property, including the stone house and along the westerly edge of the property in, and Texaco Beach. So we sold them 12 acres of land, including Texaco Beach. So that's publicly owned property. It's a, it's a public park. It's in their um, urban wilds program, meaning it's not intended for like uh, structures like soccer fields. Uh, so they, they'll have an informal path going that they're going to upgrade that will take you from North Avenue to the beach. We're also going to do a hardscape, um, a paved uh, connection from the bottom of the public street at, at the westerly edge of our developed area all the way to the bike path. Um, it's just, it's gonna be an extension of the bike path because we want people to be able to get to North Beach. We want them to be able to get to the bike path. We want them to be able to get to the waterfront without getting in their car. I appreciate that. So when can we actually see the specs for that, for those walkways, bikeways, whatever, um, you know, places in which people access the beach? Well, everything that's, uh, that, that's part of, uh, I mean, we sold that land to the city four years ago. So uh, we've been working that's with with the parks department on, on you know, cause we're gonna build the path at our expense. Um, but in terms of management of that, of that park area, that's under the purview of parks and rec department. Um, so if you want to know what their, rules and regs are going to be if they have any I, I i i don't think they're going to prohibit free access to it um so but i i can't speak uh, to what any other you know um, operational you know um, rules or regs that they're going to have but the public will certainly be able to go through our see we're doing a public street too we're doing a horseshoe street it's called cambrian way it, and, it, and it goes uh, west and then it turns north and then it comes back up east and connects to North Avenue. So w when that street is done, it'll be, de it'll be deeded to the city, it'll be a public street. And then at the foot of that public street, the first section, uh, we're, we'll, we're gonna build a, a, a bike path connection that'll connect to the Burlington Bikeway. So the public's gonna enjoy easier and better access to the beach than they ever have uh, prior to now. What's the timeline around that public access, the bike path? The bike path is scheduled to be built in uh, the summer of 22. Okay. And Parks and Rec or any infrastructure that goes along with access in the beach, what's their timeline? Do you know? I can bug them. Yeah, well, and, you know, we're just building the, the bike path. They did, they, they did some improvements on, uh, for access to, pub, to, to the Texaco Beach on the south end. So that I believe it's handicap accessible or ADA accessible now off the exi existing bike path. Uh, I can't speak to whether they have, you know, what other things they're in intending to do down there along the bike path. You'd have to speak to Parks and Rec about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So we have time for one more question or comment if anyone has one. Uh, Gabe, Gabriel. You're still muted, though. I'm not hearing that if you are. Yeah, I'm sorry, we're not, we're not, we're not hearing you. <clears throat> you wanna try again? What about now? Oh, perfect, okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I got lucky, I got lucky there, I think. Um, so I was going to DRB meetings way back when this project 
first got approved. Um, and in terms of inclusionary housing, I was just wondering if my interpretation here is correct. So the project had to have a certain number of inclusionary units to meet the city for requirements. And initially, um, to meet those requirements, the DRB approved um, that they didn't have to be necessarily spread out with the, within each individual building. And so the inclusionary units were met with what would be the Laurentide apartments. Um, so those are concentrated, but they met the requirements project wide. Do I have the right interpretation there, Eric? Well, you're, you're close. So there's two components of inclusionary. There's the inclusionary requirement for rental housing. And there's also an inclusionary, the same inclusionary requirement, 25% for, for sale, home ownership housing. So the two nonprofits, Cathedral Square and uh, Champlain Housing Trust, built 128 inclusionary rental units. And so they satisfied the inclusionary requirement up to a total of 512 rental units. So if we don't build more than, excuse me, yeah, if we, 513, if we don't build more than 513 rental units in all of Cambrian, then, then the full inclusionary requirement is satisfied in those two buildings. Now, separate from that, the if, if, we, if we stick with 513, and I think we will, the 437 for sale units also have an inclusionary requirement, which 25% uh, of those is 109 units, and those 109 units will be spread over uh, at least a couple of buildings, two or three buildings. Oh, okay, but uh, the vast majority of inclusionary units have already been met with the Laurentide apartments. Just the rent on the rental side. Okay. All Not right. on the sale side. Okay, thanks. Yes. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Eric and Jessica. We really appreciate you coming tonight and sharing this information with us. And and we would, as, as construction moves ahead or if plans change, we would invite you to come back. Well, we'll probably invite ourselves. <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, let's see. So next up, we have Mayor Mayor Weinberger to talk about the uh, police chief search. Welcome, Mayor. Yes, uh, thank you. It's great great to be with you. Um, and yes, I'm here to talk about the police chief search. Um, I also would like to briefly share with you a little bit of information about the the FY22 budget process that we're, we're in the middle of. Um, I, um, I'll start with the, the police chief search, which is uh, I'm really here with, uh, with some news. Um, well, uh, formally an announced this um, uh, tomorrow is the plan. Um, a year ago, I, um, as it was clear that the COVID emergency was really deeply disrupting everything, um, it, I made the decision that we were not in position to conduct a successful search for a new uh, permanent police chief. And we suspended the, the search and said that we would resume it after the, after the mayoral election. And um, I, I've spent the recent weeks since the election um, uh, confirming that it made sense to go forward. Uh, I, I'm quite mindful of the fact that we are in the middle of a lot of police transformation efforts. And in some ways this is, um, you know, it, uh, 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 in some ways, a challenging time, uh, unsettled time to be searching for a new chief. Um, I kind of considered the possibility that maybe we should get further along with those transformation efforts before starting a search process. But after really talking with a whole range of people, the, the general consensus is no, we're, it, we, we are going to be doing this police transformation work for some time. Uh, it's not good for the community. It's not good for the department um, to have this a sustained period of uncertainty about who the long-term leader is going to be. And so um, tomorrow we will be formally reopening the search. And and uh, but here's how we're going to do it. We're we're going to add a component um, given given um, that we are in this time where clearly we're trying to. Um, figure out a new way of doing public safety. Um, uh, really forge a new consensus about what that looks like in this community. 
<clears throat> um, before starting the search and even kind of posting the position, I am going to spend uh, the rest of this month um, uh, doing what we're doing here and going to all the MPAs, having a number of stakeholder meetings, and really, and we will be putting out a, a survey um, to uh, really try to understand from uh, Burlingtonians what what are you looking for in the next police? What kind of characteristics, experiences, um, what priorities do you think the, the chief should have in, in the, the first year on the job? Um, I am happy to, I'd like uh, uh, to take a moment also to, to introduce uh, Stephanie Seguino, who um, is, uh, I think you can all see on the screen here. Um, I, I, I'm sure Stephanie doesn't need an introduction to, to most of you. Stephanie is a longtime Burlingtonian and she is, um, did she just disappear? I saw her a moment ago. Um, uh, there she is. Uh, Stephanie is um, uh, on the police commission currently and she and Milo Grant will be the two police commissioners who will be on the search committee that I am putting together to um, both be part of this listening effort um, and then to be part of a, of a larger 11 person search committee that will review the, um, what I hope and expect will be a large number of resumes and, and, uh, and interview um, uh, many, Many candidates, viable, good candidates, and, and narrow down for uh, from for narrow down. I'm hoping three to five strong candidates for me to further vet and have um, a further uh, stakeholder vetting process, like we did last time before coming forward um, and making an appointment uh, for the city council to confirm. Um, I expect uh, my my goal is to do that um, by uh, by September. Um, the, uh, there will also be two city councilors um, on this uh, committee. Uh, I've been in talking with President Tracy about this. The, our goal is to have one progressive city councilor and one non-progressive um, uh, on, on this committee. And um, at the end of this listening effort, um, uh, we will um, publish a report uh, about what we've heard and, and uh, how we're updating the job description and sort of position profile and um, really try to be as uh, um, kind of transparent and direct as possible about um, how, how we're moving forward in, in a search process that um, that's certainly my hope um, uh, is a step in and itself towards forging this, this new consensus that I think is so important if we're going to kind of and some of the, the, the turmoil um, and, and the real disagreement that we've had about policing and public safety. Um, really, as long as I've been in office, I have sensed that we needed a new consensus. And I think there's a lot of active work going on towards it. And um, I'm hopeful that, that the chief search process can be a, can be a step in that direction. Um, I, I'm just gonna quickly, um, I think it looks like I have the ability to share my screen. Let me just show you a couple of documents so people can follow up uh, from this presentation and um, give us uh, give us this input. Um, on there will be a um, police chief search webpage. It's actually up on the on the city's webpage right now. It has uh, these dates. It has a link for the survey. Um, has this additional information. And here's another thing I wanted to make sure I, I pointed out to you all. Um, they, in addition, or I'm gonna try something this time that I've never done on a mayoral appointment search committee before and that we're gonna invite the public. If you're interested as a member of the public in being part of this search committee, uh, there's an application process that um, we are launching that, and this is the way you get to the application um, uh, where you can, um, uh, where you can apply to be uh, to selected and, and and serve on the um, on the committee. Um, that is, uh, yeah. So that's that's where we are. The, 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 this page will be updated further um, uh, over the course of this process. It'll be kind of a landing page for additional documents. Um, the survey is also, uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, a web-based survey, and and um, we'll be. Uh, you can go proactively find this for yourself. We'll also be emailing this out and sending this out through Front Porch Forum 
We have a well, something I will just point out for people wanting to stay engaged in, in city issues. Um, we've gotten much better over the last couple of years about using um, a large and growing email list for kind of newsletters from the, the mayor's office. We put a lot of effort into those newsletters um, and uh, uh, we'll be sending, you know, that'll be another way we're pushing it out. And, and I invite you to, um, if you're looking for updates from my office to, uh, to sign up for that. Um, I'm gonna shift gears uh, and just make sure that, um, so here somehow I've already clicked over to the budget um, uh, page here. We also have a landing page on the webpage about the fiscal year 22 budget. Um, this also has a survey um, uh, associated with it, which you may already have gotten in your inboxes or through Front Porch Forum. Um, let me just uh, say really quickly, we this is a really unique budget year and we're doing, this year, um, what is happening is unlike any other of the nine other budgets I've been responsible for, this one is unique. Last year's was unique too. Last year's was unique in a bad way. We had to make all sorts of seven figure cuts to, to make it through last year. And we had to spend down these reserves that we together had built up in over the last decade. Um, this is a very different budget in that because of the federal action, the Biden administration's action, um, we will have a full service budget um, and we will be able to make investments um, in strategic areas that, that make us a better community that we've never had the opportunity uh, uh, to make before with the federal government's assistance. Um, we're doing this essentially in three steps. The first step you may have noticed took place on Monday when the council approved essentially an extension of the emergency funding that we've been using to fund the city's public health response over the last year. Um, that, that was a real really um, significant thing that the city council did in the first weeks of the pandemic last year is they set aside a million dollars out of our reserves and gave the administration the authority to act quickly um, in any way that uh, we needed to, to try to help keep the public safe. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we were able to have a, a masking program and a wastewater testing program and, and a supportive quarantine program. All of that was possible because of that million dollars of funding and the three and a half million dollars of additional funds that we were able to leverage uh, working with uh, our state legislators. Let's see, uh, we have at least uh, Representative Stanek, Mulvaney Stanek here with us, good to see you, um, and working with using federal dollars. Um, uh, this gives us, we have about $900,000 to continue that kind of emergency response and to really put city dollars into reopening the economy this summer as we're bouncing out of this, um, as the pandemic is coming to an end. The next stage is the FY22 budget stage, which is underway. We had the first of four budget meetings um, this last night, and we have three more next week. These are detailed presentations from all of the all of the departments. Um, it's a really good way if you're really interested in understanding the the nuts and bolts of the budget. Um, those are our uh, Zoom um, meetings, and they also are logged and archived on on uh, Channel 17, and you can watch them afterwards. Um, we also have this landing page to try to communicate to people. If you don't have the time to show up for these, I think it's going to end up being nine or 10 hours of budget meetings over the next couple of weeks. Um, you uh, can also, um, the, this is a place for written materials here. And um, I, this, uh, uh, this is a, a memo that is a good summary um, of the budget that really articulates the principles that we have as we're trying to craft this budget. And I will just touch on them quickly. Uh, we are based, Basically, our goal is to restore all city services to pre-pandemic levels. Um, we are going to continue the historic levels of investment in our sidewalk, road, bike path, water uh, resources infrastructure that we've had since the 2016 Sustainable Infrastructure Bond was passed. We're going to continue that this year. We're proposing this in, this in our preliminary proposal to the council that we continue that. We are going to put the emergency reserves that we have spent down significantly over the last years, we're going to put them up to a prudent back, not all the way back up, but refill them to a, to a prudent um, level consistent with the policy we have about reserves. Um, we are trying to minimize tax increases. We know that this is important for multiple reasons right now. Many people still uh, being financially impacted by, uh, by the pandemic. Many others having seen um, significant reappraisals of your property that's going to result in a, in a tax increase. We, we don't want to exacerbate, we're going to do everything we can to minimize uh, exacerbating that by um, uh, 
minimizing discretionary tax increases. Um, we are proposing to make really overdue investments in racial equity and, and justice. We're proposing a substantial expansion of the new racial equity, inclusion, and belonging department, new investments in, in language access, and um, going beyond what the livable wage ordinance requires and, and paying all city workers, even seasonal and temporary workers that have only been with us a short time, uh, paying uh, the, uh, them all livable wages. We are also, for the first time, proposing that we pay um, a per meeting um, kind of stipend to people serving on city boards and commissions the way the state does to expand, um, really expand who can participate in those critical uh, civic um, bodies. Um, we um, are, we, we, as you can, if you, if you think about it, it's probably not a surprise. Uh, our electric company, our water company, and our parking, uh, essentially our parking utility, our parking fund have all been dramatically impacted by the, um, by the COVID emergency. And if we're going to, you know, really to keep those, uh, parts of city government solvent and strong, we, we are, uh, considering some assistance, using some of the emergency dollars to assist them. And finally, the final principle is if we're going to make good on all those other principles, we're going to have to um, use a significant percentage of these ARPA funds, American Rescue Plan Act ARPA funds, to uh, balance, balance that budget. Um, however, even if we there's no scenario that I see where we won't have at least 10 to $15 million still remaining after the FY22 budget is passed about a month, a month from now. And uh, that is going to create a further opportunity that um, we are, we will be back uh, here at the MPAs and in other public settings uh, requesting your input on. We're going to give ourselves through the summer and into the fall to make decisions about what we do with that remaining 10 to $15 million that we have until the end of 2024 to invest in high impact ways. So um, uh, more to come on that. I'll, I'll pause there. I think I've used my allotted time. If, if the leaders, uh, I'm certainly happy to stay for, for um, as long as you want, you know, can uh, fit me in here if you want to ask some questions. Okay. Th thank you very much. So does anyone have a good question or comment? And feel free to unmute yourself or use the raise hand function. No immediate question. I have a question. Um, so for both, both the surveys, both for the police chief search and the, the budget survey, will those be available um, in, in translated versions? And will there be outreach to the non-English speaking communities? Yeah, great question, Jess. We we um, we um, certainly are. One thing that I think one positive change to come out of COVID is we are dramatically expanding the um, materials that that we do um, that we do uh, translate and um, and distribute. And uh, with the first budget survey, um, I'm. Uh, and the timeline that we are trying to turn that around in, I am, um, because of just the, the kind of charter required deadlines and, and kind of a, a late, we've never done a budget survey like this before. And it was in response to, and I see President Tracy's with us, it was in response to city councilor feedback um, over the last few weeks that we have, have pushed that out. I'm not, not sure if that one will be translated. I will commit the, uh, the, the um, survey for the police chief does need to be translated and distributed broadly. And then um, beyond that, I will say, I mentioned it, glided over it in the budget, but um, we are proposing uh, almost $100,000 in spending to really fully implement the, the language access plan that um, was approved by the city council after really years of, of work um, uh, uh, and, and discussions between the council and the administration. Um, a plan was approved and uh, that this will become a formalized um, uh, uh, um, mandatory, uh, you know, a, a, for, a required part of city communications um, going forward. We are both budgeting to kind of translate, um, you know, kind of foundational documents that um, people need to kind of success that are uh, 
you know, frequently used in city government as well as to be um, available for kind of ongoing um, uh, translations. Another thing we're funding is the Trusted Community Voices Program, um, which also set up really uh, created during the pandemic, but we're trying to make permanent, helps us get information um, about uh, city initiatives out to our um, refugee and immigrant communities and to get feedback back. And we definitely will be using, working with these trusted community voices um, on both the budget and the police chief search to, to engage and get feedback from, from those communities. Great. Thank you very much. And I think there's also a wonderful opportunity for both the language access and the trusted community voices program to support the NPAs too, because I know that we could all, all of our NPAs could use some, some help in, in increasing access to, to these meetings and this, this information. So thank you. Uh, yeah, you that great point, Jess. I, I think that's right. And, and um, one additional kind of component of this you know, significantly expanded effort, again, you know, coming out of the pandemic that we want to hold on to is um, we are um, we are sending out postcards on what's supposed to be basically a monthly basis that are translated into, I think, seven different languages, eight different languages. And um, uh, I would, um, I think, uh, and uh, uh, Pitt, um, who uh, may be with us tonight, and I know frequently works with the MPAs, she's also working um, with the trust uh, on that program and with the trusted community voices. And I think she can help get that. I think working with her would be a great way to make sure messages that um, the MPAs are, are trying to send out um, do get to our refugee and immigrant communities. Thank you. Any, I think we have, have time for a final question or comment before we move on to our representatives. Let's see. Seeing none. Um, well, thank you very much, Mayor, for joining us tonight. There's exciting things coming up in the city, and, and it's nice to see so many ways for people to get involved in these big decisions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jess, for, for your leadership on, on the MPA and everything the Executive Committee does, and thanks for the chance to be with you tonight. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, so next we, we have, well, we're almost on time. Um, and we have our representative updates. And let's see, we'll start, why don't we start with Emma? Uh, you know, as the legislature's uh, winding down, I know you've been working fast and furious in these last few weeks, uh, to, to, for, for the last few weeks of the legislature. So we'll hear from you first, and then our city councilors, and then our school commissioners. Hello all, and I appreciate, if I bump the line, I appreciate it, because my assistant needs to go to bed soon, so I don't mean to pull that card, but I'm pulling that card, so um, buckle up. I think I'm the only state rep on, so I'm going to try to give a thorough update, as we all know, at the end of the session, which um, for us this year will end at about, about a week or so. There's a lot of things moving, and it moves fast, and it moves a little furious, and uh, at a breakneck speed. So I just tried to look at last week's calendar and bills that have moved and passed to give you all an update or things that are about to um, pass, I should say. I'm gonna lead off with an unemployment bill that I personally have done a lot of work on because it spent a lot of time in my committee, House Commerce. It started as S10 and I wanna also just start by thanking anyone who was from wards two and three who um, uh, took time out and either submitted testimony or participated in a public hearing about a week or so ago on unemployment. It is very hard um, to come and testify even in the best of conditions, but to testify on Zoom in two minutes or less and talk about unemployment, especially what's happened in the last year with so many Vermonters, 30,000 plus are still on unemployment and the experiences of our under-resourced Department of Labor. I just really wanna commend and send gratitude to anyone who did testify or submitted um, written testimony, because it is, um, we have a lot of work to do to make the process easier and better for unemployed folks. Um, but S-10 is a bill that is now gonna be merged into a number called S-62 if folks wanna follow along. And this is the only substantive unemployment bill that is moving forward. And it started as a, a somewhat balanced bill between um, providing employers a bit of tax relief um, given how our, our unemployment trust fund gets funded. It's, it's a complicated formula. If you want to geek out with me, I'm happy to get into the weeds, but not tonight. But folks just need to know that um, it's there's a formulaic um, system under current law that would have really jumped employer tax rates up significantly July 1st because it's based on how much gets used in the fund, the unemployment fund. And obviously, 
a record number of folks were on unemployment. So the system doesn't know that. It's sort of like a robot. It just assumes, okay, we have to increase the tax rate in order to fill the fund back up, basically. So if we did not intervene, it would have been a big tax hike for employers. So that was part of the bill. And the other side was at, from the Senate a, a modest um, dependent benefit for folks on using unemployment who had children um, to help cover basic needs because that's the premise of unemployment is it's a bridge to keep people attached to the workforce and getting back to work. Um, that got stripped out in my committee and I was one of the only dissenting vo votes and um, I am forever committed to workers and bringing that voice strongly into the state house. And so it was as a new legislator, a little unnerving, I'm gonna be honest, I'm with friends, um, but I stood my ground and I um, started to really work hard to make sure that other legislators outside of House Commerce knew the importance of keeping something in there for workers. So just today, um, the House Ways and Means Committee um, put together a proposal, which my committee took, took back and voted on and supported unanimously, which puts a $25 a week benefit for all UI claimants back into the bill. So workers will be able to access that and have an increase in claim benefits basically. Has to still go to the floor. But I really wanted to report on that one in particular because uh, so many folks are still on unemployment. That will kick in after federal uh, pandemic unemployment benefits end around Labor Day. So it's something that will continue on probably up to about at least 10 years or so based on how the, the language is written. So I'm pretty proud of that one. Um, the other ones I'm gonna do a drive-by on. So if you want more information on it, you could just let me know. Um, but we passed this week S15, which is um, a voter uh, related bill where we're gonna allow um, municipality, sorry, we're gonna allow the state to mail all registered voters in a general election a ballot. We learned how the importance of that and the increase of voter participation through the pandemic, sort of out of necessity. And we're now enabling the state to do that permanently going forward. Um, also enabling local um, communities to do that by choice for town meetings. So Burlington can opt to do that for whatever reason um, going forward. And it also allows what, what's called ballot curing. So if anyone who had voted for the first time by mail or by, by dropping off your ballot before um, last time and made a mistake, uh, we did, did not have the ability to allow town clerks to um, allow voters to, to notify the voter and correct the ballot. So that is now something in under law that voters can do. The, the town clerk is, is allowed to open the ballot early, check it. If there's a mistake, be in touch with the voter and people can correct their ballots and have a chance to actually have their vote be counted, which I think is a pretty good thing. Um, the other just two things I'll mention um, are our Burlington charter change items are in a bill called H448. There's a lot going on this session um, that, and I've been working with Councillor um, Carpenter and Councillor Pine on this, and I appreciate their, um, their uh, work together on this as a coalition. Uh, so we're hoping that the airport question, because it's a pretty minimal, not super controversial item, will um, prevail on its own and still move in this last few days of the session. But the other three items are just taking more time. And we've heard um, from our speaker that that will be a priority bill early next year. It cuts it a little close for you know timing of just cause eviction and, and these items are uh, ranked choice voting for city council races, uh, just cause eviction um, uh, to start the ordinance process here and thermal energy. So it's just taking more time to dig into the, the details, but we have a commitment that that is not lost, but will be a priority next time. And then the other just very brief one is S13 is a weighted study, um, the weighted study issue related to education funding. And I'll just briefly say, that is coming to the floor in the next few days. And it basically would create a task force to dig into this. There's a study UVM um, did a, about a year plus ago. And that one's around looking at how we calculate um, education spending and how students get weighted, per pupil gets weighted, um, looking at categorical aid as well as the weighting factors. So that's in the works. I'm always available to ask, answer questions. You can reach out to me. My email is on the legislative website. Thank you so much for letting me jump the line. And I can hang on for a few questions if, there's, if there are any. Thank you so much, Emma. Do we have questions for, for Emma before we move on to the city councilors? Jeannie. Hi, Emma. Um, as you know, the idea of like where S13 is right now, it's really important for you to convey to anybody um, in the final decision-making process. I mean, this is my opinion. And actually I'm speaking for a coalition 
of school board members that have been formed um, uh, all over Vermont, like all of these school board members have formed this coalition to, to advocate and lobby for the student weights to be implemented. And when I say the student weights, I mean the weights from the study. So as of now, S13 looks like it still could be amended or I'm gonna say it in the nicest way, fudged and kicked down the road without actually um, becoming uh, the task force actually implementing the weights. The idea of them going back to the drawing board seems just so ludicrous. Um, I'm I'm happy to have a conversation separately from this. I, I realize like not everybody on this line is invested in that, but I am very invested in that. So, well, we should be all invested think, because. Emma, yeah, I hear you, Jean Jeannie, and I, I would say like everyone should be because Burlington has the potential to really benefit from a system that's more equitable within this weighted study. And it's an interesting um, element where Burlington and Winooski in particular have solidarity, have a kind of a similar cause with very rural districts, which could also benefit from a, from a re restructuring of how we do education. Um, and there's some parts that were just frankly not really um, well defined when this when this was all put into place. I don't even know how many years ago now, 20 plus years ago. Um, the the task force process does call for several public hearing pro pieces of it. So I would encourage anyone who's interested. This is the power of organizing to to intervene in those. You know, not intervene. That sounds weird. But <laughs> to uh, engage in those meetings. And the report itself is due back in mid January. So there is time for us to act on that next session and to be in touch, especially with education committee members. I mean, I, I am sure that I hope the Burlington delegation is fully vetted and, and um, uh, informed on this. But it's often the committee of jurisdiction who really needs to make sure they don't um, water down the elements of a task force report and actually take it up and move it. So I hear you loud and clear and I'm with you and happy to talk more offline. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Emma, and your assistant. Uh, we really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, and we'll move on to our city councilors. And Max and Brian, I'll, oh, and we have Art too. Oh, beautiful. Zoom. This is her portrait of all of you on Zoom. I love it. Right? That's wonderful. Right? <laughs> that definitely needs to go on the CEDAW website. <laughs> Hi, Ruby. We love your art. <laughs> yeah, great job, Ruby. Thank you, Ruby. Oh, see ya. Okay, so Brian and Max, who would like to go first? You can go ahead, Brian. <laughs> All right, so I'll be very brief. There are two things I'd like to mention. One is the um, nearly 50 openings. They're not all really open, but um, on the boards and commissions coming up. The deadline is actually tomorrow. So if anybody's interested, in applying for serving our community by, by being a member of one of the 20 plus boards and commissions. There's, there's nearly 50 openings, um, meaning that the, the seats are up for renewal. It doesn't mean that the person who's the incumbent is not seeking to be reappointed, uh, but it's, it has happened before that incumbents for one reason or another uh, don't always get reappointed. So, um, it should be an open process and it's uh, meant to be an open process and the appointments don't take place until sometime in the middle or late June, but the applications are due tomorrow. I would encourage anyone to go on the city's website. Uh, it's a city council page on the website. Uh, you'll see the, um, the tab on the left, which is boards, commissions, and committees. You click on that and then it goes into the vacancies that are event that are uh, open. So encourage folks to take a look at that. The other one is that the, City Council recently created a uh, Burlington Aging Council, and this concept is um, is one that has been, it's not entirely new, but the focus uh, on seniors was um, sort of put on on the back burner in a way uh, after a study in 2019, a group of, of, of seniors and, um, and service providers and just stakeholders who care about issues affecting older Burlingtonians came together and one of their recommendations was that we form a local council focused on issues affecting uh, seniors and this 
it's the, the charge of the group is to review and make recommendations regarding sort of long-term provision of senior services to bring the, the voice and the interest of seniors to the policymakers um, uh, at, the state, at the city level, but also perhaps even uh, at a state level. So it really attempts to give um, you know, more focus and more voice for um, older Burlingtonians. And um, I think it's, a, uh, it's um, an idea whose, uh, whose time was overdue. And I'm really um, glad and proud to have been part of the effort. But it is, it is open for anyone to apply. The uh, process for that commission or council is um, open till May 21st. And then the mayor and the council president in consultation with the city council community development and neighborhood revitalization committee will review the applications. And um, just to give you an idea, it's a, um, it's a commission, it's a council, which I think is intended to be um, very representative. I will mention quickly that it includes a one member, member representing a healthcare provider, one member representing long-term care organization in Burlington, a member representing affordable, an affordable housing organization, one representing an organization working to fight food insecurity, one member representing an organization providing advocacy and support for older adults, uh, one member representing an organization supporting new Americans in Vermont, one from an organization advocating for racial equity, inclusion, and belonging, one member representing a senior center, uh, a, a member representing an organization providing mental health services, one member representing an organization providing transportation services and focused on transportation issues, and one member representing uh, the city's um, community and economic development office. And last three, three to five older adults living in Burlington who may or may not be affiliated with one of the above groups, but um, intended to be uh, sort of the citizen voice, if you will. Um, and that is all I have for tonight. Thank you, Brian. Max. Thanks. Thanks for that, Brian. And thanks for having us again. It's great to see everyone. Um, so for, we had a pretty big um, council agenda covering a wide range of topics this last week. Um, we had a resolution looking at counselor pay um, that in counselor compensation, um, counselors, if you don't know, receive about three, a little less than $400 a month um, for our uh, serving in this role um, and um, Councillor Stromberg and some others on the council have um, been looking at this as an issue of um, one that can be very limiting in terms of who is able to serve and how much um, they're able to do even once they get into those roles. And so um, in that resolution, um, which started really more being focused on Councillor Pay, got broadened out to look at some additional other potential barriers that could um, be um, standing in the way of people getting running for elected office and serving an elective office, things like dependent care, uh, as well as health care. Um, so that resolution was referred to the Charter Change Committee with the idea of them reviewing um, those issues and potentially coming back with a charter change proposal um, to be put forward to the voters next March. So we've got plenty of time to look into those issues. Um, there was another resolution put forward primarily by um, Councillor Jang that had to do with creation of a dog task force to look at some issues that I guess that have been persistent in the new North End, but uh, that I think are issues that neighborhoods across the city uh, experience, whether that's um, aggressive dogs off leash, um, dog poop, those kinds of things, um, trying to, to, to create a task, a, a group to look at those different issues. So um, that passed and that'll start getting going. Um, after many years of process a, and, and debate and discussion, um, a partial, and I say partial because there is still more work to be done, but a partial weatherization ordinance passed. And this is an ordinance requiring landlords to weatherize leaky buildings. The reason that it was partial is that there was broad consensus around the need to address the leakiest buildings. And so they were able to identify what threshold essentially those buildings would uh, meet in terms of just them being absolutely terrible in terms of energy efficiency. And so um, for those buildings, there was a broad agreement that we just needed to get this passed and get them starting to work on those really terrible buildings. Where I think the, the rest of it comes down to, where the rest of the debate kind of um, was a little bit more disparate was around 
some of those less leaky buildings, but that still certainly need attention. Um, and both from a climate perspective, but also from a quality of life and cost of, of living perspective for tenants. Um, and so the agreement, the, the disagreement um, was more around um, for those ones that are still in need of attention, but less leaky, what, what you would, what time frame we would be addressing those or requiring those to come into compliance. And there were concerns around availability of, um, of weatherization contractors and those kinds of things. So um, I'm of the mind that we really should just be requiring it. And you know, if they can't find someone, that's one thing, but at least require it and force them to, to really take a good look and really prove that they couldn't find anyone. So that will continue to kind of, kind of go forward. Um, and then the last piece, and I'm not sure if the mayor touched on this, I think he gave you a broader budget overview, but I did want to just highlight um, some pretty substantial spending that was, um, that was um, greenlit um, at the council this week. Um, I'm not sure if I can share my screen because um, I have that up. I just want to run through just some initial spending of the, the American Recovery Act dollars. Okay, great. I will um, just share that briefly. I know it can be a little difficult to read those kinds of things, but I just wanted to bring it up um, just to give folks a sense of how at least this initial chunk of what is a much broader um, amount of government spending um, that will be taking place. Um, so you might have heard that we've received um, $27 million um, in federal funding through the American, um, through the, the ARPA or the American Recovery Act. And so we'll be seeing um, that money come in over time. But um, there were some initial pieces that um, we were wanting to roll out. And there was significant discussion and, and back and forth. Um, the first piece was around wastewater testing. Um, if you don't know, Burlington has been doing significant wastewater testing at our uh, wastewater plants throughout this pandemic. And that has really helped us to track surges. So wanting to see that continue um, so that we have that predictive ability um, looking at, at different um, surges that continue to happen to take place. This is a great public health tool that's really helped us to be responsive um, to the different trends that we're seeing there. There's also vaccines, vaccination site support, $100,000 for that, and really trying to um, create um, inclusion around that and make sure that we're continuing to reach um, all Burlingtonians in those vaccination efforts. So we'll continue to see that. And then also what the mayor was talking about a little bit with those emergency uh, enhanced emergency communications. So really trying to make sure that, again, we're being inclusive about those, converse those, those communications and how we're pushing those messages out and really continuing to learn and evolve around those communications. There's also quite a bit around, um, uh, quite a bit of funding that was included around um, getting um, things back up and running on an economic and community level. So thinking about um, mobile placemaking, so really trying to create ways for us to get out and enjoy um, public spaces and um, try and make those spaces maybe a little bit more flexible than, uh, and be creative with those spaces so that we can really make different use of them and really enjoy them in safe ways. Also just trying to have um, different activations around the city, so making sure that there's all kinds of different ways for people to enjoy themselves um, as we kind of come out of this pandemic, um, whether it's through open streets or pop-up markets, decorative lighting, those kinds of things, significant mural project. There had been um, one of the areas that got significant debate was around graffiti removal. We've heard quite a bit of concern around graffiti removal. An initial proposal had been to have um, to buy a vehicle for and for for graffiti removal. Um, we felt like that might be a little bit um, overkill, um, given that you know this may be a, a situation where we've seen a significant surge in it as a result of the pandemic that may go away. So we certainly want to address that, but don't feel necessarily that. Um, we need to be investing all of that money and that we need to be really careful about weighing that need against all these other um, other needs that our community has that are that may be sort of more basic in nature. So food assistance, for instance, those kinds of things as we as we think about how we spend this this significant money and the opportunities there. Um, and then also just some additional um, constituent services. One thing that I was curious about was this ninety seven thousand dollars for software. Um, they're thinking of getting a different kind of software platform from um, what they're from what we currently have. So we currently have C Click Fix, which they know is which works pretty well for like addressing like a a pothole, for instance, because it's a location you can take a picture of it, it, drop a pin where that is, and they know where it is, and they can really follow that through. For some of these other things, like how you navigate 
um, like a rental relief program or something like that. It doesn't work quite as well. And so they're wanting to make an investment in that so that they can really track who all has who all from the city and what different departments have interacted with um, different aspects of that that tenant's question or that that um, that community member's issue um, and really track it so that they're providing good responses and timely responses. So those are just a couple of different pieces of that funding that I wanted to touch on. And then there's still some left over in that, um, even just this initial chunk. But again, there's still substantial money left over that will go through additional community process. That's why that, that survey that the mayor mentioned is happening. Um, we have budget sessions that are ongoing for that broader budget that the mayor mentioned. Um, we have several next week, public are certainly encouraged to come. There's a public forum at the beginning of those. Um, we're also pushing several of us on the board of finance, Councilor Pine, myself, have uh, been pushing for an additional town hall component, trying to get um, just more constituent feedback, both on this big chunk of money and the opportunity that it presents, but then also just making our budget more inclusive and receptive to public feedback than it's been in the past. So I'll pause there because that was quite a bit of information um, and see if there are any questions and I'll stop sharing too. Thank you. Um, Els, you had your hand up before. Did you have a question for Councillor Tracy or Councillor Pine? I was just, sorry, I was just gonna um, just mention sidewalks. Any, any extra money to fix any sidewalks? <laughs> I know it's a constant losing battle, but yeah, for sure. So um, we've been uh, in the last several years doing about three miles of sidewalk replacement per year in the past and in prior budgets. Um, well, for several years, we've had enhanced sidewalk. That was a result of the investment that um, you all made in the sustainable infrastructure bond um, that's allowed us to address um, the, the real backlog in sidewalks work. Um, so we'll continue to do that. There's been a couple of initial um, sidewalk projects that'll happen, though there's still certainly more to come. Um, and if um, and so that will will continue to roll out um, over the course of the, the summer um, as we as we kind of get into it. But again, there will be about three miles of sidewalk work that should happen um, from now well into the fall. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Uh, Gabriel. Can you hear me? OK, good. Um, I really like the uh, idea of um, city councilors getting paid more, and I, I was really happy to see that. Um, I was wondering, with the broader discussion that happened, if anybody was talking about barriers, um, kind of like on the other side, like not so much what is stopping people in terms of what's waiting for them, but what might be challenging when people are actually running. So. Um, you know, cost of a campaign and things like that. And uh, one thing I wanted to say was, um, I had a friend who ran for the state legislature and she won her seat. And I noticed that um, she was waived from collecting sig signatures in person because of the pandemic. So she was able to, she had the option to collect those sig signatures online. And I thought that was really nice in terms of like a nice option for somebody who might be concerned with safety, disability access. And I would like to see that be a permanent option for all local and state campaigns <clears throat> is that people can collect those signatures to get on the ballot online. So like, for example, I don't see myself ever running for anything. But if I did, I wouldn't be able to go door to door uh, very easily. So it would be really nice to have that option. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Gabe, I think there's some really interesting ideas there that um, I think deserve a lot more discussion as far as the community around how we can make it possible for people who um, may face mobility challenges or, or other challenges that make it hard to run a traditional campaign. I would say that COVID has certainly shown us that, um, you know, there's ways to 
to engage with people that doesn't involve trudging through the snow in January and February um, to be able to reach people. So I think um, I think there's a, probably a lot of creative ideas out there, and I think it's a, a broader community conversation about how we can make it more accessible for folks to to be engaged. And I, I do think that mailing ballots to everybody, for instance, is one way to ensure people um, you know have greater access. And and we don't require people to go out and get signatures on a petition for any office right during COVID. So that was the case um, that 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 practice was instituted. Um, so I have to say, as somebody who's done it many times now, it's it's actually it's a privilege and it's an incredible honor to be able to interact with people at their homes. But I recognize that it's not something everybody can do. And so I I think you're you're bringing it up is really um, is a helpful reminder that it's just not available to everybody. Thank you, uh, Jeannie. I really appreciate that. Gabriel, and I am looking forward to hearing more ways in which people can be stewards of our city um, in, in accessible ways. And I do believe that um, it should be like challenged by choice kind of thing. The way that we have these mail-in ballots doesn't necessarily mean that you can't go to the polls, right? So the way that you can run for office doesn't necessarily, I am hoping to extrapolate from what you just said as it's a challenge by choice situation which you either get signatures or can submit your, um, you know, buy for office. Uh, via something online and, and 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 there's other ways for people to get signatures you know I know at one point when I was I'm just saying trying to get permits for things that went on with the ramble I was I I was given the, the privilege and this was not during the pandemic to get people to weigh in via emails and sign up on permitting um, uh, in, in support of, of whatever we were doing. So I think that we are not abusing a system. We are using a system to help us or all more be involved. So that's a great, great, um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie, and thank, thank you, Gabe. So let's see, uh, I think it's time, it's time to move on to our school board members and our last item of the, uh, of the evening. And we have all three of our, our members here tonight. Um, and I would love, just because this is my first time facilitating as a steering committee member, and I just feel like this rush of power. Um, and I would love to ask Polly to speak first and then Jeannie, and then Stephen, if that's okay with, with, with you all. Hi, thanks, Jess. Um, so my plan was not so much to speak and give an update as it was to um, respond to questions, but I will say that we need a high school, and I think many of you have read the news, and um, I felt for me like it was an easy step to take to vote to say we need a new high school last week and now the challenge is going to be how do we build community support and find the right place so um, that's my primary focus right now coming out of the pandemic but also how do we get a high school going sooner rather than later so that's my preoccupation and my update for the moment, and I pass the baton to one of the other school commissioners. Jess, I, I know you said I would go next. I've been very much focused on S13, the waiting pupil study being implemented um, 
as a part of our educational tax funding. Um, how do I put it? Scheme. <laughs> um, it's it's just such a controversial issue, and um, I'm also hoping to answer questions about it. In addition to that, personally, um, as co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, um, we've been trying to schedule a, uh, a educational opportunity for the board to engage in anti-racism training and also a binicky, um, uh, unfortunately, many people say Abenaki, but it is Abenaki, um, once again, a workshop or an educational opportunity for the board to uh, just learn more about our history. All of this is uh, part of work that I hope the board will engage in in eventually um, crafting, or I don't want to say crafting, I want to say sincerely having buy-in with an anti-racist statement on behalf of the board. And when I say that, I mean a very layered um, point by point uh, uh, directives and objectives for the board not just for how the board will direct the district, but also the work that I um, foresee the board doing in, in, in educating ourselves and, and moving forward with, oh my God, my neighborhood is so loud, I'm sorry. Um, in, in actually forging a statement, not a statement, but a commitment. And, and also um, not initiated by myself, but another commissioner, Martin Gulick, uh, land acknowledgement, um, talking about, you know, we, most meetings start with the pledge to allegiance, which is not necessarily, uh, it's, it's just not enough. We need to pledge allegiance to the people whose uh, the history of, 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 of the grounds on which we are operating, right? And how oh, I'm also helping along with Polly plan the retreat um, for the board. That's my main things I'm doing right now, but I'm looking forward to questions. Hi, I'm Stephen Ward too. And um, I just want to reiterate what Jeannie said about the importance of the weighted study. It's a little disappointing to me to see that there's going to be a task force and there's going to be a report out in January because we've done a lot of um, you know PR with the elected representatives in Montpelier. And it seems to me that it would be nicer if it could move a little faster, but I guess we'll just have to wait for that one. But it is extremely important for Burlington and Winooski and other, as um, as um, Emma said, smaller towns in Vermont too, who would benefit from a more legitimate analysis of the students and what and what their needs are. <clears throat> but you know, there's just so many things going on, and you you know that Lauren McBride has been hired as the principal of BHS, and that there's an assistant principalship open. And that we have another principalship of Edmonds because uh, Mr. Kiefer has decided they're, he's moving out west with his family. Um, so there are lots of lots of moving parts as usual. In terms of the high school, you know, um, th the discussion right now is is site appropriateness, and there are numerous sites around the city that could be considered. So that's really the first step is is seeing where the site could and maybe, and then to get a plan drawn. And in the meantime, we're downtown and we have that three and a half year lease. 
The biggest issue that I've heard about the downtown site is the noise inside the building. The light seems to be okay. The kids seem to be okay. The teaching is happening, but the, the noise needs to be mitigated. And there are plans in the works to uh, make that more appropriate for the opening of school in September. So that's where we are in terms of that. Um, I'll, I'll stop at that and answer, help answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Stephen and Jeannie and Polly. And I realize I jumped right into this into the school board without officially thanking Brian and Max. So thank you so much for your time. And we'll open this up to questions. And you can feel free to unmute yourselves or raise your hand. I'm gonna put a question out that I've heard from constituents and I don't know that it can be answered tonight, but it has been this question around funding of a new high school and funds coming into the, um, the school district with some very clear designations for how the money is to be spent and simultaneously money coming into the city. And there are a number of people who are saying without a viable high school, we don't have a viable city. And we really need support from the city to make this happen. And could some of this one-time miracle money, that's kind of what it feels like, both from the district perspective and the city perspective, go toward funding a new high school? I think one of the frustrations and possible misunderstandings I've heard is what the money is earmarked for that it might not necessarily be earmarked for construction, that it might be earmarked for social and emotional engagement or um, academic recovery. Those are examples from the district level. But I do think it's valid to say without a high school, without a place for kids to be that really is a place that has been clearly designed for them, we don't have any of those things happening. So I just want to put that out there because city councilors are here tonight to say I've had a lot of people asking me questions about money coming in through COVID recovery funds to Burlington with this unique situation of needing a high school and how and where that money is earmarked and how it's going to be spent and a really strong desire for it not to not go towards this project. So that's possibly a uh, not an answerable question, but one I think should be brought up now. I would just um, be able to respond briefly and not, not with a great amount of detail, unfortunately, but to say that um, there is still almost, there's very little guidance from the federal government at the present. So ARPA is this huge thing and we know so little about it. So the list of questions is much longer than the list of answers. And that is true for the governor and the legislature. And that's why the governor's allocation of ARPA funds was greeted by the legislature with a pause button of, wait, 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 we, we can't really plan to spend the dollars that you're planning to without knowing what we're going to be allowed to do. That, that guidance is starting to come out of treasury but it's, um, it's gonna be a while, it's gonna take some time. So I guess the answer is, I think, I think we all share the, the desire and the goal um, to get our high school rebuilt, a new high school built, but um, I, don't, I don't think we have any answers right now. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna give folk, folks a false sense of, uh, of, of optimism, except to say that I think the community will come together and find a way to, to make it happen if it's possible. And on that same thing, I think that I, I view this as, a, as an issue that's going to require significant collaboration between the council and the, the, the school board. And so I reached out to Superintendent Flanagan and Chair Wool um, this week to just see um, if we could just at least start that process. I'm not envisioning like that, that conversation that we had earlier um, where it was a, a more lengthier one. I know that you all are sort of also at the beginning of your process, but just to get that conversation going. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to have this as an item on the agenda for our next council meeting, if only to at least just get a sense, get counselors up to speed fully on what you all are dealing with and the, a fuller picture of the, the situation. Because I know that counselors 
pretty much across the board are concerned about this. And so I just want to want to create that that open dialogue between the district and the council and the administration kind of right ne starting now and continue that over the, the course of the next several years. Uh, that that feels so good to hear. Um, we obviously need to bond together. We need to, uh, you know, obviously the school board cannot do this alone and they shouldn't because this is about our entire city. So however many fractions of our city municipalities we can engage, that feels right to me. Also, Polly, um, I believe these funds are time sensitive. It's not like, I, you know, you know, at some point, what they're used for will have an expiration date. It's not a, it, they, they just get put in the bank account and we get to use them forever and ever. Or maybe I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, that's great. But obviously, um, I, I mean, it is probably a thing where they're going to be marked for certain objectives. Hopefully more about student experience than infrastructure, but that's just my personal opinion. But I'm saying that because anything that goes into, and at this point, can we call it the re re-envisioning program or project, I, it's going to take years, right? We are already five years deep into what we thought would be something that would be somehow in place. I mean, I mean, when I say in place, I mean, starting to happen right around now, physically, actually. So if we are going back to the drawing board, which we are, and we're going back to the drawing board, not necessarily knowing where our physical space is going to be. So we have to factor in that if we're gonna get input from the community, figure out finances. And when I say community, I really want to stress to everybody on the line right here, especially to my city councilors, B T C anything about the Burlington Technical Center needs to be as large as a voice as any representative from Burlington High School. What is going on at the tech center is completely genius. And our general public has no idea what a gem we have in our community. And I am saying that so lightly. They're winning awards across. Okay, I'm not going to go on, but mark my words, Burlington Technical Center is an innovative program that is going to make their mark in our nation very soon. With that said, they need to be a part of anything that has to do with this new school building. And that's going to take time. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a really great point, Jeannie. And the tech center is such a resource. And we should have, we should have a presentation at, at one of our coming up NPA meetings about what they're doing there um, and how they can help shape the, the future of the school too. So we'll, I've got a little scribble on my note, on my paper here. So we'll definitely do that. And we, we've gone over time. I'm so sorry. Uh, we do, Tony has one question. We can maybe finish with that question. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Jess. Uh, and thank you, school board members, for uh, you know going back to the drawing board and saying we've got to start again afresh and look what it is that's going to provide a, a a facility for our high school students. It's going to be quality. It's going to meet the needs and look forward twenty years. I think that that was a part of the issue to begin with. You're really you're really given a second life on this. I heard yesterday from. Uh, 
your one of your compatriots, uh, 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 Allwell from Ward, I believe she's Ward One Two, uh, excuse me, Ward One Eight. Uh, that uh, the reason that you're abandoning the, the school is, is uh, and this is a question a lot of people had, was this $12 million guess, a guesstimate on what it would take to uh, remove the uh, existing uh, uh, contamination. And you first have got to, you first got to have money for a building. You have, that, that comes first, and that's why you had to abandon that site. You may not get to spend $12 million that that the last dollar you spend would be trying to deal with that that Hulk, which may be the new uh, brand plant of the city that sits there for for decades before something's done. I'm sure that won't happen, but I, I liken it to that. So I guess my comment is one: thank you for making the decision you did, which is not easy, and es establishing the priority of getting a fac good facility built, and that wasn't going to be possible realistically to afford the cleanup and a new building at one time. I think that was part of it. And also you didn't really know what you're gonna run into in trying to, to uh, uh, remove that building or, or, or even if you, if you chose to go that route. Um, it's not easy. Uh, I think you will have the community behind you. I think that uh, we're now forward looking in the city uh, that, and, and the work with our legislators is, has already uh, gotten dividends at the, at the state level and that cooperation is gonna have to continue. A sizable portion of any new construction should should be sought uh, for this and other new buildings, school buildings across the state from the legislature. Thank you. I'm just going to jump in and say, Tony, of course we care about the money, but I believe the decision was more about protecting people from risk. It it had more to do with the idea of working with a space and with a building that is toxic. I, I, I mean, no matter what we do in the future, we still have to spend a ton of money to clean up that site. The idea of moving forward with the re-envisioning project had more to do with safety than money. That's my personal opinion. And, and I'm a really frugal person, so. I'm a big spender myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, 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 the, with, with tax money. Well, I think we'll wrap, we'll wrap up for tonight. This has been a great conversation and in excellent information. There's just so much going on in the city. And Polly, Stephen, and Jeannie, thank you so much for your intrepid service and for keeping these things moving along. And Brian and Max, thank you for helping lead the, the city through pandemic and then some. Um, and we're so grateful tonight for a Channel 17 Town Meeting TV for, for making these recordings possible so folks who can't be here in person can watch it. Thank you so much to Liam at CEDO for supporting supporting the, the steering committees and this work. So And thank you all for listening and watching tonight and in the future days. We really appreciate your participation and we look forward to seeing you next month on June 10th. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Jess. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone.